keynote speaker is uh, Dr. Marie Batiste of uh, Portladec First Nations and has made Eskasoni her home. Recently retired, now a professor uh, out of uh, Merida University of Saskatchewan with degrees from the University of Maine, Farmington, uh, Harvard, Stanford Universities. Marie's scholarly interests have expanded uh, the production and dissemination of research and knowledge that transforms education through decolonization of research and knowledge. That transforms education through uh, reconstruction and renewal of indigenous knowledges, languages, and the reconciliation of self-determination of indigenous peoples in education and beyond. She continues her research in a national study in a seven-year partnership advancing in indigenous knowledge, uh, citizenship education, and thinking historically in kindergarten to grade 12 curriculum and teaching. She's published uh, widely, contributing over 70 chapters to books, written 20 uh, referred uh, journals, 19 technical reports, delivered lectures at universities, conferences, and communities in Canada and beyond. She has received multiple recognitions, including the, office, the Officer of the Order of Canada, elected fellow of the uh, Royal Society of the University Teachers, a distinguished researcher awarded from University of Saskatchewan, and Inspire, Inspire Award for her contrib contribution in education. And she has since received five honorary degrees, uh, Mount St. Vincent, St. Mary's, University, University of Maine, Farmington, Thompson Rivers University, and the University of Ottawa in 2015. Uh, she and her partner, Sagage Henderson, are grandparents of Jacoby, an award-winning Gojwa and powwow dancer, and parents to a uh, member of Parliament and Parliamentary Secretary to Indigenous Relations, uh, Jaime uh, Batiste, an award-winning online entrepreneur, Marie Sunderlands, who is the owner of Sunderlands Creations, and an educational consultant, Annie Winterson. Please help me welcome uh, Dr. Marie Batiste. first by uh, saying thank you to the spirit that gives me um, my day, every day and, and grants me um, a voice 
um, and energy to, to bring my teachings to the world. I also thank um, uh, Blair and MK for inviting me here today. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Grand Chief, um, who's here today. I see Grand Captain, uh, my cousin, Elder uh, Dorothy Moore, and many other friends and family who have been here, and, and uh, I thank you all. So before I start, I also would like to say that we are on, um, we are all treaty people. We are all um, situated now in Unimagi, in Mi'kma'ki, the, the seven districts of the Mi'kmaq Nation that extends throughout the Atlantic provinces. It is lands that is unceded and unpurchased. And at that, you know, that is a very important part of it because these are not just the ancestral territories of Mi'kmaq people, but they are the lands that have been stolen from us. And we need to, in our decolonization, continue to advance how we shall move forward in, in recovery of our lands and territories again. As I walked through today's presentation, I've made a few um, um, links here. I, I don't know that all of you can see uh, from where you're sitting, but what I'm going to do is I wanted to contextualize where we have been, where we are, and where we want to go. And all of that is in the, in the frames of understanding um, some of the, the ways in which we'll do so through the understanding, the vocabulary, the discourses, and the commitments we make to decolonization, the deconstruction of Eurocentric colonialism and all of its harm and its experiences, and to explore the indigenous resurgence of which we are on as transitions in and through reconciliation and the reconstruction of indigenous knowledges. Don Wedebexi, where I come from. This is a, where I'd like to start by honoring my parents, my families, um, and the um, lands on which I, my parents came from. Uh, my mother from the Guysboro area, which uh, I, I think few know about a time when our people were living in Guysboro area and our whole of our nation in, in that area were removed and taken to and sent to other uh, First Nation communities. All during my lifetime, my mother would often visit with her family, whether it was in Afton, or whether it was in um, Millbrook, or whether it was in Oikagama, or Wamakuk, and, and around all these places. And I thought she was just a friendly person. As it turned out, all of our families were removed from this Guysboro area and sent to all the various reserves that, they're, that they were now located on, and my family then ended up all dispersed in different places. So my father and mother also were dispersed during the time of centralization. Endured centralization in the 1940s. My father and mother were living in Bordeaux, and they had a small growing family. And then the federal government decided to move all of our family from those, those, that community. Now, at first it sounded like it was like a, a, a ask. Would you like to go? We would hope that you would go, and we will give you a school, we'll give you jobs, we'll put up a plant where everybody can work, we'll have doctors, nurses. But as time went on, they realized that this was not an ask. It was a command, a demand. They were going to uh, burn down the church. They were going to burn down the school. They were going to remove all the teachers that could be there that were for the children. And it was a, a, a forced move. And my parents went, and they came to Eskasoni. And they came to Eskasoni, but Eskasoni was a very small community. They enlarged it bought up some farm um, homes, but they also moved people into separate, into houses together. And my mother and father came with their small family and moved into a house um, with her cousin. And um, at that time, you know, Eric, they worked in the mill, my dad, but 
you know, they could borrow from the, the local store. And as they borrowed from money from the local store for groceries and all the things that they needed, the bill got greater and greater. And as that bill got greater and greater, they ended up with a bill that was now something that they couldn't pay back with the job they had. So they left. They left this with a notion that they were just going to go pay off that bill. But they, my mother said to my father, I'm not leaving without you. Um, and, um, or my dad was, was, she said to him, I'm not letting you go without me. I know what men do in those camps. <laughs> and you are not going. And so my mother took her, her now newborn baby and her son. And because the oldest of the daughters was now at an age that she had to go to school, the community or the, her, his sister said, take her to residential school. At least she'll get a Catholic education. At least she'll get educated and she will have her first communion. And so my father and mother put her in residential school and off they went to Maine to pay off that bill to work in the farms. And so as a result, the residential school is a backdrop to my life, a backdrop of, of in ways in which um, after two or three years of my sister being at residential school because if my family lived in a tarp paper shack behind the potato house, they had no way of, of making sure that she could get educated by having a bus going coming from those places. So they, they remained there until they had um, able to come and get her and they took her. So part of that life was living in, in Maine, and then finally I was born. And so my parents stayed there, and I grew up in the States. And it was in those States living there that at least, you know, we had, I, I think, um, some housing that was better than what they had when they left. And so I developed in those years my Eurocentric education. My Eurocentric education went to a Catholic school where um, I went through eight years. I went to the Fulton High School. I later went to the University of Maine, got an education degree that my mother said, she said, you are a teacher. Now, I didn't have any choice at the time. Somehow, she just said, naturally, you are a teacher. You need to go in this direction. And so I followed that direction that she saw in me. And as time went on, I went on to uh, finish, get that degree, and we stayed in the States. And, all, and then I went, went on to Harvard. I was recruited to go to Harvard University to a Ford Foundation program. And in so doing, I met the love of my life, Cy H. Henderson, who was my tutor, and somebody who helped me through a very difficult course that I was taking called Public School Law, in which a professor would do the Socratic method, look down the list and say, okay, Batiste, give me the facts and the holding of the case. Facts, holding of case, what? And so anyway, if there's long tutoring that went on, but nonetheless, I just still don't know what the facts and the holding of the case. that year he left me and off he went to Wounded Knee to work with uh, helping them to address the issues that were going on legally at Wounded Knee in 1974. I had to go through the, the final on my own. I did it. I did it on my own. So I can say I did all of this and I got through it. But I would say that Eurocentric education was a both a backdrop to my life and also a, a gift, but also not so much in the sense of what it also took away from us. As I did my dissertation at Stanford University, I did my work on, on literacy education. And it was called An Historical Investigation of the Social and Cultural Consequences of Mi'kmaq Literacy, in which I looked at all the writing systems that Mi'kmaq people had taken up. And in so doing, looking at the ways in which they uh, learned them, transferred them, um, used them. 
And through all those systems that I came to learn about and from um, doing interviews in my own community here, I discovered some things. And one of the things I start, discovered was that Mi'kmaq people had multiple ways of knowing and knowledge <coughs> systems and, that were similar to many knowledge systems around among indigenous people. We had our own socialization, our own literacies, our own purposes, until colonization imposed its own on us. And that literacy and education are not neutral, as I had come to think in all those years that I was in Eurocentric education. They were not neutral, and each was driven by a political, social, cultural construction of society that created this assimilation that we had lived with, with, with not just residential schools, but all systems thereafter. And I also learned in doing that research at that time was that Mi'kmaq self-determination was emerging even then in decisions about language and functions and orthographies and education. And it was at that time that I really came to this full awareness of something that I had come to at least grasp a little bit in my Stanford education when I took a course from Martin Carnoy on cultural imperialism in education. I learned about cognitive imperialism, and that was the word I used. I cog that cognitive imperialism was the whitewashing of our brain, was the taking away of all of our way of thinking. It was taking away, as we have come to know, Unui Dasi, that that was being whitewashed out of our mind. And Eurocentrism, as I was come to learn through other books and materials, especially James Blount's book in 1990, talking about Eurocentrism. Now, Eurocentrism is the pervasive thing. I mean, we may call it whiteness, we may call it glacial, we may call it uh, Western education, we may call it all kinds of things. But surrounding that is this thing, this deeply embedded within this thing called Eurocentrism. Now Eurocentrism is a center that is the British center, and which pushes out to the periphery, periphery all of the all around, you know, whether around the world, whether it's Africa, India, you know, New Zealand, Australia, North America, South America, all of those places, your centrism was being diffused out into the periphery. And with it was a notion of superiority. A superiority of languages, a superiority of progress, a superiority of thinking, and in so doing, it created this hierarchy of peoples. Some peoples they could take and they enslave. Some people they could remove and dispose of. Some people they could kill. And in all that, it was characterized as a singularity that has, has remained in Eurocentric education to today. And we see it diffused as universal in all of its forms, and we continue to find it don't we, Grand Chief? <laughs> I was just talking to him about that. Anyway, so what I was saying was that this is, was the engine of cognitive imperialism in which whole nations and groups of people have been denied their knowledge systems, their cultural and spiritual identities, and the land and wealth confiscated. And so what, it was through that process that, that also our people were then removed and sent to residential schools in distances so far away from their homelands. It was there that 150,000 or more Aboriginal children were sent to these over 100 schools. And in there was the failures, the lost knowledges, the skills, the connectedness to land, to family, community, culture, spirituality, humanity, sciences, and knowledges. And it was a beginning of a time as it, when I was growing up, a young woman, of seeing and coming back to Skazoni and seeing and feeling a sense of nihilism, a lot of uh, dysfunction in families 
that had returned home from, from residential schools but had no way to use that knowledge that they came home for with except for sewing, beading, and a few uh, crafts that they continued to carry on. Now it was that the TRC calls to action and, and the work of the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission noted that the impacts of the residential school system were immediate, ongoing, and that Canadians had been denied that full and proper education as to the nature of Aboriginal societies and the history of the relationship of, uh, between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. This was cognitive imperialism. This was a thing that everyone was measured up on and against. Whether it was you went to school and you took those tests, whether it was a test for children in the primary, or whether it was a test that you ended at the A when you went off to high school. All of those were then parts of that assimilation process that was normalized in our education. Normalized in schools, normalized in societies, normalized in all professions, and that became a way in which people were race, classed, and gendered, around those particular normative functions. It eroded our collective identities, it ignored treaty rights, it, it ignored the multicultures that came, the diverse languages while privileging only colonial languages and those kinds of uh, the um, knowledges that went with them. In the last couple of years, I learned of a new word. I want you to know about it called agnology or agnotology. Now I call it cognitive imperialism. They call it agnotology. I, I, I love new words. It's sort of like cognitive imperialism. It's sort of like this hierarchical, invidious, monoism kind of thinking, you know? But agnotology, interestingly, is, is defined as the cultural production of ignorance. Ignorance. Or how ignorance is produced through neglect, secrecy, suppression, destruction of documents, unquestioned tradition, and social political selectivity. We see a little bit of that in the South today, don't we? But ignosis is a Greek word for ignorance, not knowing, and so it is. That when we did a study, as in, as, uh, when in 2010, part of a research project on animating meanwhile humanities, the shirt grant that I got, we did a study of Nova Scotia curriculum. And I had a, a, um, one of our researchers, Nancy Peters, who did um, a chapter in this book. It's a, a, it is a reduced chapter. Her report is twice the size. And if you think this, this chapter is long in this book, it is a reduced a portion of that uh, particular study that she did. And as we looked at the curriculum of, of Nova Scotia, from the time of the settler colonial contact to uh, the books that they were using, the curriculum guides and so on, to the present of that time, 2010, we learned some things. Now mind you, we also learned that a lot of people don't uh, have uh, the curriculum guides, the earliest ones. But if you're a teacher, you're a hoarder, right? We're all little hoarders, and we've got little boxes underneath our bed, right? And we stack them in our closet, and we would never give them up. Never, ever give those things up. Well, in so doing the study, we found a bunch of hoarders, and we were able to get this information. And what did we learn? Again, curriculum is not neutral. Contextualized within power, dynamics, and privilege. Discourses of ourselves are situated in the values, attitudes, and perspectives of stakeholders and gatekeepers in power. Who are those? That's the province, that's the Ministry of Education, those are school boards, those are book publishers, those are the authors of the book uh, publishers, teacher training institutions, authors of guides, textbook, I mean, little, uh, um, you know, those. Uh, little pocketbooks, and also it was in the approved text. And the approved text revealed Eurocentric notions of good, of normal, and problematizing indigenous people from their perspectives. 
So in that particular review of all those literature and all that time, she found that Mi'kmaq people had been narrated in certain kinds of themes. They were, they were sometimes feared. They were sometimes pitied and ridiculed. Sometimes they were stereotyped and admired. Sometimes they were thought, oh, they need to be saved. They were sexualized, romanticized. Um, emulated, copied, assimilated, acculturated. And so it was in that study that we did, we thought about why do Canadians know so little about Indigenous people? And that is because of the way in which we have been narrated through all these different forms, these different ways in which everybody in the society, you know, was gathering this information. And you know what? That's my education. That is, you know, the people before me's education. That's people across Canada's education. And today, you know, when you look at CBC News, you can't plug in anything you want into those particular comments anymore because only in about the last five years did they stop doing it because of the racist diatribe that was coming at them about Indigenous people. So you can't just do that anymore. But that wasn't all that long ago. So we realize how very much late this notion of stereotyping continues to arise across Canada. And one of that thing that leads me to this transition is to say we are all have been either a victim or a beneficiary of that same education system. Some of us like have this English and some of us have degrees, some of us have all these other kinds of things. And yes, we get a job and we get to do all these things, but some of us then lose our language, lose our culture, lose our connections, lose our land, lose our place to live in, in and with the community we love and want to be with. We are all, you know, become both the beneficiary and the victim of that system and that none of us have learned how to decolonize education. Decolonization is new, and I would say that I've had a role in promoting it. But at the same time, as I do that, and I continue that in the job that I do as the decolonizing um, special advisor to the vice president, provost at Cape Breton University, I'm doing that job of helping to decolonize that institution. But you gotta get people interested. <laughs> also get them to know what it means to do this decolonizing work and it is not easy work. You're laden with resistance at all kinds of forms and I'm sure that I need not tell you that. But one of the great things, I'm going to switch a little bit of the good things that's happened and one of the things that's happened is in my era, my time, and I feel like I've been both the product of it as well as the generator and the activist of this, is this indigenous resurgence, the indigenous renaissance. It was coming about in the time that I came back home um, and, and began working at Mi'kma'way School. And it was in that time that I began my decolonizing education. It was with Merdina and with Elizabeth Paul, Merdina Marshall, and, and of course, um, Lillian Marshall. And Alec Denny was the one who brought me home. And when he brought me home, he brought out a whole bunch of boys and they got in a truck and, and Ugly was among them and they dropped, came into California and they all got out of this empty truck and I said, holy man, how am I gonna get home with all of those people? because he was going to come and get me. But anyway, as it turned out, we did get all those boxes loaded up in that truck and put a mattress on top, and the boys were then feet first in the top, and off I came home, and Alex said, we need you to be home with us. And it was his insistent all the way home that, that I had to be here. And it was in that time that I then took the role as education director at Mi'kmaq School. 
And that began an education journey that was largely built around Mi'kmaq language, Mi'kmaq reading and writing, and the hieroglyphs, and teaching the kids their prayers in the hieroglyphic writing system. It was a magical, wonderful time, only matched by when I came here at Eskasoni to be the language and cultural coordinator and work and doing every day of working with elders and working on planning materials that was every day put in the hands of my kids when they came home and they looked at this and said, look what I did today. And I knew I put it together with them. That I was so, it was filled with emotion and pride in that work that I did. But it's important to know that decolonization is not just my word or even, this is a worldwide phenomenon that began after the world wars. Decolonization actually was something that led to the human rights covenants and the human rights doctrines and the human rights um, elements. So what decolonization after wars, wars was, was a remedy to the empire, remedy to this orientation of the singularity all-powerful, this Eurocentrism. And it was to reverse through international law a move to decolonization in two principles. One was human rights, the other was self-determination. And so these two foundations, one is both the, the recognition of fundamental human rights that all humans have, and their, their right to self-determination as a political entity, as individuals, and in their society. So decolonization begins in Canada with a constitutional change, when, when Canada actually became its own independence, developed its independence from the empire, Britain, um, the, um, uh, the whole British empire, came about in 1982 with the Constitution Act. And so it created the constitutional and fiduciary obligations of Canadian and governments to respect Aboriginal treaty rights, Section 35.1, affirming Aboriginal and treaty rights. And it created the Charter of Rights, too, for all the individuals of all the people, of all multiculturals and so on, as well as all those whose individual um, sexual orientations and otherwise um, uh, gender females and so on, but it also said that those charter rights could not override Aboriginal and treaty rights. That Aboriginal treaty rights were the supreme law of Canada. And these were then affirmed in 2021 in the UNDRIP Act. These are really, really important for us today because the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People starts off with, well, first of all, that we have the right to the full enjoyment as a collective of individuals of all human rights and fundamental freedoms as recognized in the Charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Human Rights and International Human Rights Law. And secondly, we have individuals, indigenous people and individuals are free and equal to all other peoples and individuals and have the right to be free from any kind of discrimination in the exercise of our rights, in particular, on their indigenous origin or identity. And thirdly, and most importantly, in me, my view, is that indigenous people have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine that their political status freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. And that concludes our education. So UNDRIP is a very important thing that we need to remember today. It, it rejects forces of assimilation. It affirms our right to practice, revitalize, and teach indigenous knowledges and cultures. It affirms the right to establish and control educational systems in our own knowledge and language. It affirms our collective dignity and diversity. It affirms our right to establish our own media in our own languages. It affirms the cultural and heritage and knowledge systems. And it affirms the supremacy of the treaties. Let us not all forget what that means. 
that decolonization is something that we are working toward, and that is, it is a necessary, ongoing process of unlearning, uncovering, and transforming the legacies of colonialism, as well as utilizing the education and knowledge systems available to relearn and rebuild the social, cultural, linguistic foundations that were lost and eroded through colonialism. That is the tenet, that is the important building block. And so, it means that decolonization requires making space, balancing, generating, and enabling diverse knowledge systems to thrive in higher education, as well as in through educational knowledge, transmitting places for indigenous people, that formerly colonized or continually colonized nations and peoples and cultural knowledge systems. Now, this was the work we did with the uh, Igniting uh, Change uh, Report of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences in 2021. You can find that in the Congress website. So decolonization, indigenization, and reconciliation are all things to which both the TRC calls to action have, has urged us to do through reconciliation. Indigenization is a term that's been used in the university systems, coming from University of Canada's indigenized, uh, indigenous priorities, and then, of course, decolonization, a much larger framework but th there is some differentiation. There's a little bit of differences among them, um, and, but that I, I will just share with you what I think some of the two prog processes are for decolonization, and those are the unpacking of all the colonial narratives and all of the, our own self. Sometimes, you know, in our own life, we recognize how, de how colonial we get in our thinking and our way of being and so on. And part of it, we begin, is with ourselves. It's a personal unpacking of what we are assumed and also to begin to build the foundations for a recovery and restoration and renewal and regeneration of indigenous people's knowledge systems. It also requires indigenization being a proactive and dynamic process, strengthening inclusive communities and partnerships that respect and understand the value of indigenous people's knowledges and practices, engaging in critical reflection on the colonial history, operationalizing the TRC calls to action, and promoting self-determination. So what does that look like? Well, if you look at your school systems or where you come from, you're going to see indigenous governance, you're going to see indigenous educators, you're going to see indigenous communities connected in authentic relationships. You're going to see indigenous content for self-determination for the self, the community, and the nation. You'll see indigenous laws and knowledges are foundational to the framework for all the operations. You're going to see indigenous people as senior leaders. You're going to see indigenous students have leadership opportunities with an active voice. You're going to see indigenous as the institution having indigenous strategic plans and indigenous student success plans. And you're going to see respectful and welcoming learning environments, respectful and inclusive curriculum, culturally responsive pedagogies, mechanisms for valuing and promoting indigeneity in education, cultural responsive assessment, affirming and revitalizing the Aboriginal languages, indigenous education leadership fostered in, in, in professional development. We're going to see non-indigenous learners and indigeneity fostered and culturally respectful indigenous research. Now, reconciliation has had many things that I, I think has been ongoing. What, some of it in the early days was additive, and the additive building blocks of just adding people in without changing the structures is really a, an assimilative mode. So all you're adding is senior leads, all you're adding is teachers, all you're adding is curriculum and a few books. That it really says that assimilation is where we want to go. 
It's only when we begin to do, build everyone knowing, everyone aware, everyone building their own reconciliation frameworks and foundations do we begin to build toward reconciliation education. And we need to then build upon more power sharing in those particular places. In decolonial education, as I've noted, it's been about self-determination. It's about the recovery of identities. It is about place and land-based education and learning and those foundations. It's about the recovery of the oral traditions. It's about the diverse indigogies and pedagogies. What's an indigogy? Well, Indigogy is something that my, my friend Stan Wilson in uh, the Ojibwe Elder uh, has used as we look at what we do in and on the land. What we do with pedagogy has to do with teachers and students in a classroom, with a principal, a superintendent, in a school, in a, you know, a school board, all of that structure is within a pedagogies of learning. When you're on the land with elders doing communally activated learning, holistic, lifelong, otherwise spiritually developing themselves from the self to all things in creation, is building the vault blocks of indigogy. So what we do out on the land is indigogy, what we do in the school is pedagogy, because the focus is then on the P, the ped, the child, whereas in the indigogy, we're working on the indigenous collective knowledge and from which we then build our children into. So that is the way we're, through which we are going to recover our own knowledge, it's a way in which we're going to begin to rebuild our foundations around our very own um, notions of how to, how to teach. I grew up learning through the basket. My mother would sit and, and, and work with the basket and, and through beat on the land and getting the wood and doing the wood outside and so on, all through my lifetime, the basket was a way of learning. But it was in those times that she would teach. She would teach not only about her family and her stories and, her, and about the nation and all their struggles and so on, but she also would be telling me about how to do things. And as time went on, I learned how to do those things. And it was when I was in doing my um, teacher education that I went to Passamaquoddy Reserve and had a time when I said, hey, why do you build your basket around a mold. That don't make sense to me. They said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, my mom would say you have to know how to feel, you know, the, the, the how to make it and pull it, and, and, and it's all in the feel. And so they said, here, you do it. You show us. And I, indeed I did. <laughs> and I sat there with the basket and made, you know, the basket but it was in understanding the tension and the feel of that, that, uh, that uh, basket making that I learned how to do it. So basket making is a methodology. It's a holistic methodology. It's about learning communally, activated learning in a holistic uh, way. It's about the spiritual connections. It's your connections to all of creation. And in every part, as I've often said, unfolds a whole. And each part that we take up as indigenous people and we begin to scratch away at that one part, eventually it unfolds the greater whole. And it is in understanding those that we come to know not only about our personal lives and our family lives and our community lives and the lives of our nation, but it also helps us to understand the importance of the struggle that our people have lived and what we need to do to get there. And so basket making is a symbol of knowledge, economy, expertise, excellence, livelihood, teachings, education, sustainability, as well as creativity, protection, safekeeping, and carrying out our traditions. Decolonization, said Linda Smith, one of my heroes in my lifetime, 
says indigenous people should understand their own history and research back and engage education for their own purposes in their own ways and teach non-average people about their appropriate place they can have in decolonization. And in my day, in my time, these have been some of my heroes. Helen Sillaboy, my dear friend, and Berdina and Albert and Lillian and, and Sarah have been all indigenous renaissance activators. You know, all of our leadership here and there and everywhere, uh, Levi Sock and, and, and Margie Gould and all these other places that are whose, whose pictures I could not find last night as I tried to build this thing. But anyway, these are still remain my heroes. They help us to remind us of the importance of our human rights and our rights to control, to maintain, to protect, to develop the manifestations of our sciences, our technologies, and our cultures, and the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop our intellectual property in traditional knowledge. And so it is in my, during the work that I'm doing right now, is continuing to work on the protection of indigenous knowledge and heritage. I'm writing with Saigage our second um, version of our book, Protecting Indigenous Knowledge and um, Heritage, and that's coming up hopefully this year. Our dear friend, Albert Marshall, who is working hard on working on doing two-eyed seeing, and we hope that our, our elders will continue to be blessed with the voice and the energy and the ability to keep on doing this work as they continue to teach us throughout our lifetime. And I'm going to end on a couple of these slides just to say how important it is for us to understand that present day realities are affected by history and current systems. And we need to become aware of them and acknowledge them and as well as to fight against them. We need to challenge racism, Eurocentrism, and the dominant assumptions of knowledge. We need to seek out anti-racism, anti-colonialism, which are very, very strategic aspects of decolonization. And we need to build them into our own repertoire. We need to assess the effectiveness of current culture of students as inclusive of indigenous people, present and non-present and what can and should be changed. We need to advance social justice and indigenization as an asset for all. As we do that, we develop a reconciliation action plan and goals and outcomes for ourselves, for our colleagues, for the school, for the unit. And we engage indigenous knowledge fully, widely, deeply as a learning feature of our own professional learning and building a voice in support of diverse knowledges and inclusive student experiences and speaking up for cultural safety, equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization for all. And finally, we build upon and respect the land, the animals, the spiritual entities and peoples, and ourselves, and honoring the learning spirit that we each build and grow from and honoring each of the learning spirit of every learner that we have before us, honoring them through gentle teachings of love and respect and the four honors of respect, responsibility, reciprocity, reciprocity and relevance, and sharing those indigenous learning concepts. This is my big vision of what I want our indigenous knowledge systems to be, not a bridge to indigenous or to Eurocentric knowledge systems, but be strong on their own and from which we all can build something from. This knowledge system, these knowledge systems are what our ancestors have left for us and we must make sure that we have it not just for the seventh generation, which I figured out was about 500 years, but really we need to make sure that it's for the 14th generation, for a thousand years from now, we need this language to survive. We need our people, and each one of us is part of that direction and making sure that our seventh generation have a glimmer of what we enjoy today. Thank you so very much.
lot of you agree. Presentation is El Torres Gloria and Rainbow. On behalf of Antic, um, Marie, and 